but one and a half year later, uh, we married. And I married not only her, but her five kids. At that time, uh, between four and 15 years. And since then, 2003, we managed to, manage, to build up both our professional uh, and political uh, careers. Um, she invested uh, a lot in the dialogue program. She invented herself when she left the embassy. I did my way uh, in uh, lobbying, always with an eye uh, on politics. And then came the year 2011, uh, when I was picked as uh, State Secretary for the Ministry of Health. And a year later, she was picked as uh, Permanent uh, State Secretary for European Affairs in the Bundesland, uh, Hessen. So, how did that happen? Well, it was very easy. It's all about networking, and it's all about investing uh, in your name recognition, and it's all about hard work on the issue you love. And uh, the day has 24 hours. Um, there is a weekend with 48 hours. And uh, if you look uh, on work-life balance, it's uh, more about work and less about life and balance. So um, you are better when you make work part of your life. So that is uh, some kind of a very short uh, answer how to break glass ceilings. I think you don't need my advice, but I think uh, you have your own experience with networking, with meeting uh, the right people on the right time, with being lucky, of course, in some places. And it's all about competition, and not only competition um, within uh, the different genders, but competition as such uh, in, a, in a party setting. And I'm eager to hear more from those stories tonight. Uh, I would be very happy if I can add on my life experience. And I'm very sure I can do that because we have so many decent people in the room uh, who have a say on that. That's from my side. Happy to have you here. Feel free to ask uh, any question uh, you like to your, our panel and to our guests. And now it's up to you, Katka. Please take the floor. I'm so glad to be here with you, and I'm very, very happy that I can spend this evening with such a like-minded friend. But, however, what I'm not happy about is that in the same moment as we are here discussing this great book, talking about gender equality, there are still people, journalists, other politicians out in the street who are questioning if political women are young enough, old enough, if they are too bossy, uh, how can they reconcile their lives, how do they dress, and things like uh, that. In the same time we are having these talks, abuse happens somewhere else. I'm from Hungary. I'm a newly elected member of uh, European Parliament from a young party called Momentum. And being a female politician as a liberal regime, I think certainly told me some stories on how the system oppresses people. In my country, it was perfectly acceptable for a member of parliament to say in his speech, in the plenary, that it, uh, we would have less cases of uh, violence within the family if women would stay at home and do the dishes more. That happened, I think, three years ago? Something like that. So I, I'm not happy. I'm not happy that this is still a reality. And you know, I quote the agenda for sustainable development in this point that will make you unhappy, I hope, because it says, that equality of participation by women and men in politics and opportunities for women's leadership at all levels of decision making have been globally acknowledged as vital contributors to more prosperous and stable societies in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So this is set here. And I'm, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say, but we are doing a very bad job on this still. And of course, there has been like a lot of talk about how much progress we had. And we should appreciate the progress. But I'm sorry, I cannot appreciate that women take, uh, women consist half of the population of our world, or of Europe in general, and yet they only occupy one third of, every, uh, of elected office. We have almost 85% of mayors who are men. There are, I think, in 10 EU member states, men make up at least 80% of the national parliament, 80%. It's horrendous. And even 
even in this house, in the European Parliament, which I consider a very progressive institution, we still don't have the right laws in place to enhance the uh, participation of women in politics. Our group, the Renew Europe group, will be missing two votes for the next half year at least, in plenary, just because two female politicians made a very unexpected choice to have children. We don't have a framework for that. And when I raised the question at the Budgetary Control Committee uh, on, uh, in the Parliament Discharge Procedure, if the Parliament can implement a proxy voting system that's uh, been done in a lot of countries all over Europe, the Parliament said, okay, oh, this is not possible. I suppose this is our job, your job, my job, the job of like folks working all over this city to make this possible. Because what we miss by having inequal, unequal representation. Of course, first of all, we miss social justice, which I suppose as liberals have to be very important for us. But also, it's a very big cutback on productivity, for instance. If you have a company and its laws are not being uh, made well, you just miss a lot of opportunities to employ women, or women are uh, falling out of, uh, out of work because of a badly designed social security system. If you don't get support for childcare or for elderly care, a lot of uh, productive uh, working hours can be lost just because a lot of politicians don't even think about these issues because they never face it. Women representation gives an equal voice to an equal part of society. And that should be important for us as humans, but also as economic beings, because we can only design laws that are fit for the entire society, for our entire economy, if everybody has a strong enough voice. And what to do, of course, it's a lot of complaining so far. What to do? Um, first of all, I would like to get back to the issue of abuse of women in politics. Um, my dear, now fellow MEP colleague, Sorry, sorry, so sorry to say that. Uh, Phil is here from the United Kingdom, and when I looked at you, I recalled this article a few months ago when uh, the UK elections were taking place, and some some newspapers advised female politicians to only campaign uh, in the uh, in, in the bright daylight because at evening they could be you know anything can happen. It happened a few months ago. Um, another thing. To tell tell the crowd about personal stories. Um, this is a picture that was just posted by a Fidesz uh, parliamentarian, I think, a week ago. Um, there are, these are female politicians in, from Hungary. I'm here. That's me. Um, I, I I will give it a round. Yeah, that's me. Uh, the upper four women. They are with Fidesz, and those those of us we are opposition politicians. And the text says it's like we them. And uh, your 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 face ref uh, reflects your soul, or something like that. Uh, I I want to pass this picture around because it's truly horrifying. Uh, I think most of the women in the below they are like speaking or like shouting or I don't know taking part at, at some activities, and they are perfectly posing, yeah. you know, beautifully styled behind the background. <laughs> That's you know when you go into politics, that can like circulate the entire internet. And this is your reality when it's not about debating about your ideas, if she was right, if she was wrong, like how she looks. Harassment is everywhere in politics. I would really like love to, for you to take a look at it because it's truly horrifying. Abuse, bullying, uh, even death threats and rape threats. I mean, I get rape threats every day and it's like not only about me, but like a lot of colleagues in the parliament have the same experience. Uh, if a, a woman takes public office, they are public property in a way, and uh, there, we don't have an, any adequate mechanism in place to protect female politicians from abuse. Of course, I, I suppose that also concerns male politicians, but surveys show that female politicians are way more subject to harassment than anybody else. And if you couple this with an already difficult system in many countries, societal uh, restrictions, uh, family restrictions, requirements of you know how a good woman looks like that. They take care of their family at home, that they are not being bossy, that they are calm and peaceful and homemakers. Like in a lot of countries, this is the image of the right woman. Does it encourage a lot of young people to go into representation and have a loud voice? No. And that's what we have to do. We have to ensure, and I'm really hoping that uh, all of us now, after this seminar goes up, down and after we read the book, 
we were ready to take action, to change these things, to give space for women, to motivate young women to take office, to be role models for them. If you are in office as a politician, and mostly if you are female, I, I, I think it's, it should be a priority to mentor others, to help those who are somewhere else at their career. We should hold out hands uh, to, to each other, because only together can we achieve strong results. In this house, uh, a lot of legislation is passed. A lot of resolutions are passed also. I think next week in Strasbourg, we are having the, something like the 15th resolution on equal pay. Parliament always, no. Could sound very strong statements about we demand equal treatment, and we do. But real change won't happen if the pressure on government won't be strong enough. If everything is getting back blocked in the council, if there is no real political willpower, then we can get we cannot get anywhere. Neither we in the European Parliament, neither any of you in either the state parliament, national parliament. I really believe that we have to change the system to give women a voice to be a more fair society, to be a more equal society, to have equal chances. And for that, we need each other. We need women in politics, we need women in NGOs, we need women in, act in activism, but also women who just want to live a happy life, have opportunities, not be discriminated against. We, and I suppose that's also concerning men, because we are already part of the same whole. So I'm really hoping that in the future, women's issues wouldn't be women's issues at all, but it will be an alliance all over those who want a just society uh, where everybody has an equal voice and where nobody can be subjected uh, to mistreatment or harassment or bullying, and where we can all work together for a prosperous society uh, where happiness and equality are the main drivers. But for that, we need to be angry. And I'm really hoping that you will be angry at one point and demand better, because we deserve better. We deserve better than harassment, bullying, discrimination, and uh, unequal treatment in the workplace or anywhere else in life. We deserve better, and together we have to get to this better place, because if it doesn't happen in the European Union, it wouldn't happen anywhere else. Thank you very much. I think now it's your turn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, so in inspiring speech and telling about your uh, your personal experience and the hard fight you are, are conducting. Let me say that we are here today to introduce two things. You see the Liberal International VIPP Index and we also have a handbook on inclusion of women in, in politics, as you, as you mentioned. And this has been uh, an effort by the Liberal International Human Rights Committee. I'm very happy to see two fellow members. Bill uh, Benyon already mentioned, Vice, Vice Chair of the Committee. Please raise, please, you can applaud him. Previous MEP from, from UK, we would wish you were worse than MEP, I would say. And, and also Nilsson Söderström from, from Sweden. Uh, and, uh, let me also at the same time introduce two other persons from Ally who are here. Our new uh, human rights officer, Mikaela Hellman. And uh, our brand new, uh, a brand new, new intern, Viola Nikos. This, this is her second day in at, at ELA, so it is brand, brand new. But uh, coming back to, 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 to the items of, of tonight, the, we are so happy to be able to introduce for this audience and for the European audience the result of a long work that we have been doing uh, to have both these two tools. Uh, we organized with the with our cooperation partners, FNF, uh, Centre Party, other parties, the uh, Liberal Party of Sweden and, and the Liberal Network of, of Africa, we organized workshops to try to collect the best practices in, uh, uh, in talking about women's inclusion. And may I say that we didn't only do it for
for the, the they are not only working for this inclusion because of the blue or, or, or gray or brown eyes of women, but we are doing it because we also believe that societies are more prosperous, are more stable, are more successful, as you were, were saying. And I mean, in fact, I'm also wearing the SDG pins here, so I do, I do believe in it. I, I have heard sometimes also uh, that the Northern African countries, when a uh, women's situation retracted, it also started the decline of these cultures. And let me also say that, that um, we are we, one point of departure, of course, for, for this uh, endeavor is based in what we, we, you know, we have always our science of saying something. And I want to say and mention that you will find it, the Andorra Liberal Manifesto, also developed with the close cooperation with the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. It's necessary to quote because in that manifesto, which is the basis of our current work in Liberal International, uh, the organization with 100 member parties, uh, cooperating organizations, that's the, the basis for our work. We will say that uh, liberals stating that main challenges for liberals are to make human progress as dynamic as possible to ensure that it becomes more equitable, encom encompassing, and inclusive for all. And, and that, that, is, that uh, manifesto, is, those words in the manifesto are very important for us, especially as we have a situation where the manifesto was adopted under the leadership of, of uh, Karl Heinz Bakke, uh, president of the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung and deputy president of Liberal International. And this, every word is very well weighted in, in the manifesto. I, I actually also think and believe that uh, inclusion and social justice is one area where we as liberals are challenged. This morning I read a piece of the executive director of Chatham House. Uh, you, all of us who are interested in, that, in national politics know that that is the, the think tank in the UK on foreign policy. And he says that the failure of globalization to deliver its gains equitably across Western societies over the last 30 years has created an upswell of resentment against those politicians and political parties who champion globalization. I do believe that this is the challenge that the Liberal parties have to, to work with. We must debate that question that is a little bit of another but inclusion and social justice are some of the, of the answer uh, to, to that. So uh, let us try to see how the handbook can uh, tap into, uh, into the, how they can tap into the power, into the possibilities, help uh, advance uh, uh, equality inside political parties making them more uh, successful. And I actually also be, believe that many of the things we are saying in the handbook are very worthy for uh, any organization. And let me also state one thing which maybe is familiar to, to Orsa, uh, coming also from a Nordic country. I come from Finland, also comes from Sweden, and we have sometimes, you know, the, the, it's a bad habit to say, we do it this way in the Nordic countries. But let me say that uh, so you, sometimes you equate, say, you know, that uh, equality is something that's very, very far in the Nordic countries. We have gone a bit forward, we have been champions, we are not necessarily always that anymore, but it is not a social democratic innovation that we always have to fight nationally. And it is not that because we had some kind of equality before that came around. And it was because I'm saying that to a very deep interest in history. The Nordic countries were living in hard conditions and they needed all their men and women. They needed, and that's why one of the reasons also Finnish women got the right to vote and to be elected as the first, ele or were the first elected members of, of, of parliament. I can even be a little bit more personal. 
I have roots in the Åland archipelago. And we have, a, we have a, let's say, a myth, which is partly true, that in the uh, Finnish archipelago, women had to care for the house, for the children, for everything, because the men were so much away, either permanently or, you know, half part of the year. So we became strong, and we became used to taking decisions. We can, we, can, we can talk more about that after, afterwards. But this is, you know, to empower, to make use, to, to take uh, decisions. And there are many women's, women in the world that we can see how African women are forced to take decisions when their, their men have gone as, as refugees. We can say in crisis situations how women have, have often played uh, a big role, though they are not getting the, the place at the negotiation table because they're not necessarily having, having the, the, the troops. So, so dear friends, uh, we, are, we are here now to, to introduce the two tools. And um, you can see the beautiful, beautiful uh, logo of the, of the WIPI. We call about, talk about WIPI, the Index. Uh, women, uh, women's participation in, in, in politics. This is a tool more for our liberal parties. We will help them to see how they score in their environment. We have used a societal index for, for that. This has been developed together with with NPI, and I also want to mention that our previous Michaela's predecessor, Tamara and uh, Dan Dancheva from Bulgaria, invested in launching that. Uh, those of us, those of you who are interested in using that, it now will really be rolled out uh, in, in February, it has been the testing phase, and we can assure you that over the sky, not creating too, too much CO2 uh, going to different parties, we will be able if you so ask, to, uh, to get a little bit of guidance how to do and we ho how to do that index and how to see you sc score over the years. But the, the handbook, that is a, a, a different thing. And when we worked with the handbook, we could see how interesting examples there were in different parts of the world. I remember so vividly how our our, our party we are cooperating with in Bosnia had measures in place to ensure that women and men got equal resources when they were electoral campaign. Because this is access to resources in politics is something which is, which is uh, with besides the connections and besides the will is very, very important. Uh, and, and we can also, we have heard how, how Centre Party in Sweden uh, had clocks registering at their party conferences how much speaking time did women and men get. And we have uh, also many parties that have policies in place in exactly so that those who are harassed will be, can easily report on their, uh, on their harassment so that they don't feel in intimidated. That is also a good, good practice. So, and, and when we talk about progress between countries. I think also we need to be aware that you can never take progress for granted. You can never, because there are these phenomena that we, that we spoke about, Katka, who try to push back in societies where we have, have also had more uh, equality. Uh, and, uh, and also mentioning, when you mentioned the, the, the question of online and how women are actually the target of that. That is one, you know, uh, those of you who are familiar with the equality world, world there is something called the, the Committee of the Status of Women meeting annually in, in New York. And Liberal International, together with National Democratic Institute and uh, the International League of, of uh, Liberal Women are organizing a side event exactly on that issue together with the, the, the UN Rapporteur on uh, Violence Against Women. Uh, she's speaking at our event, the UN Rapporteur on Privacy. And we have also been able to get an MP from Finland, my dear friend Eva Bilbe, and then also uh, the, Mozilla, the, the Mozilla Foundation behind the search, uh, search engine, whatever we call it. So, so there's going to be, we need to see what are efficient uh, ways to combat that 
harassment. Uh, because, and it's interesting we are doing in the, in the US because sometimes you can see that when you are harassed from abroad, and especially from US, it's very difficult to get anybody you know, action from, from the law enforcement. There is one who has some, some exa examples on, on that. Uh, the handbook, some words be before we start the, the, the panel. I want you to, to see, we have some hard copies here of the, of the handbook, and it may be Michaela I still can wave it, but it is easily found on Liberal International's homepage, uh, not, not, uh, so you can have a look or you can download it, it is there. It's not a prescriptive handbook. It tries to show what has been good examples, what, what has been worked. For organizations, for political parties, it points to the necessity of having a good plan. Uh, it's also to be, we want to be clear that working only for total gender equality is not enough. We try to measure, we, I hope you will measure also and evaluate what is the real impact. Because, I mean, okay, quotas have all been debated very much in liberal international quotas for, for men and women. We are always debating that, that very much. And we can see in some instances that we, we, we get nominally a good representation in legislative bodies, but very bad influence in executive, in the executive. And maybe the executive is even more important <coughs> and to have real influence. And I also hope that the book helps you to be aware of what are the obstacles for inclusion. There is a good example in the handbook also, you know, where the normal rejection reaction when we start to talk about equality. No, there are no problems in our organization. We are very equal. Haven't you heard that quite often? And no, no, we shouldn't take care of this because people are different and sometimes don't want to, to participate. Or, or, you know, blaming exactly as in Hungarian case, blaming the, the women for not being active because in spite of that, that there are obstacles. There are some good, very good examples. And I think we, I think we, we take quite seriously also the, re the recommendation that it's good to set up an action plan. Because then you can have measures that, that are more, let's say, uh, they follow better, that they just, and yeah, the action plan is good. And I also quite often have a feeling that it's very important to convince the leaders of the party, the leaders of the organization, the leaders of the town, uh, and have some male ad agent as, as well. So, in a very, very broad outline, and we are going to discuss the, the, uh, the handbook and our experience more in, in detail, but then let me say before we start the panel that I also want to, to thank some, some of the good, good friends. I mentioned Tara, Tamara Bancheva, who you, many of you know. Without her, it wouldn't have been possible. Also, uh, a, a, a fellow MEP and member of our, uh, of our committee, uh, Met Abir al Rani has been very, very helpful in, draw, uh, in drawing up the, the handbook. And, and, uh, and she's now not here in, in Brussels for the reason that Katka was saying, but she's so much uh, inspired us. And all the parties that helped us with the wo workshop, but finally, also Edith Nauman Stiftung Foundation. Without you, we would not have had this occasion and we would not have had the printed, printed handbook. And we are very grateful and we hope that we can continue the cooperation in spreading the good message. So thank you very, very much. And, and let us now start the, the panel and I want to uh, invite the, the, the panelists uh, here uh, to the up to the podium to, to the to the stern and I, I think Jana will, will help us a little bit step set the stage. But please come up here.
friends, uh, I'm very, uh, very happy to have uh, such a variety of experience in gender uh, equality work in politics. Of course, the only thing that this is all women. Maybe I hope nobody has pro protested against against that. We are we are very normally we are very very, very careful that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, not only all all men uh, panels. But let me let me first uh, introduce uh, my my friend Mo Sokwa, approximately right. You are you are vice president of Cambodia. National Rescue Party, the Liberal International Party, with whom we really feel much solidarity. And actually, we're going to discuss your situation uh, in Cambodia uh, tomorrow. But we know that you have been also very active in your party with uh, equality questions and also working in the civil civil sector. You were also uh, mini minister for for. Um, uh, Women's affair in many, many six, six years, 1998 to 2004. So we know that you have a very, very long track record in this issue, and also been chief of the women's branch of the party. Applaud to me, Mo. Manon de E. Yeah, and you are working at the European women's lobby, uh, the real lobby organization, I think, you know, knowing what is going on in the European Parliament and in, in the legislation. You are a campaigns officer there, Avid Menska, Menska, who led uh, the EVL's 50-50 uh, campaign uh, for the European Parliament uh, election. And now you are continuing with, for instance, the, the, the last Beijing plus 25 process, that's one stating also record of what has happened after the very, very important platform for action that was adapted 27 years ago. Maybe you said something that very scary back or forth. And uh, finally, Antoinette uh, Azenova, it's a, it's a AA, AA <laughs> double A, triple A, we should say. Uh, you, are, uh, you are policy officer at, at, at LIME, May I a little bit, uh, she's also standing as a candidate for the president, I um, mean, the, the European liberals in, in, in Europe. Uh, let's say with that abbreviation, and you are working as, as also an assistant in, in the European Parliament. And you, I think we know that Lyman has very interesting examples of how far you have gone with women's representation. So with these words, let me, let me, uh, Ask maybe more for you first, and you, you can take a, a, a question. But uh, before I forward, uh, give the floor to, to more, you can see now there is something uh, in the modern way join at sleda.com and, and hashtag whip it. It means that anybody in the audience can put a question for, for, the, for the debate. And also those who are following us outside, they can they can put a question. And then you can put a question, and you can vote for a question of somebody else. So it, the questions that have got much support, we will be trying to take uh, first after after the after the pa panel. And we certainly want to to make sure that uh, every that the questions are from the audience also will be debated. But move first. What is the best practice you have experienced? in uh, increasing inclusion, and, and all, all the, the three of you. Thank you, Astrid. Before I answer the question, may I congratulate Liberal International and President Norman the Foundation for uh, the publication of this handbook. What the theories, the findings here are very useful. I'm not going to go through it, and I think as what I will concentrate on asking, answering questions which is relating specifically to the kind of work and the career and the, the path that I have chosen for to work, walk on for the past 25 years now, which is defending the rights of women at all levels in all sectors and in particular in politics. 
I started the in dedicated to politics after the in exile uh, from my home country, Cambodia, for 18 years because Cambodia went through genocide, you know, for almost four years. And I went back home after 18 years, started a, the first NGO run by women, local women. And then got into politics when I went to the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. How many of you have heard of or went to Beijing in 1995? Yes. <laughs> right, you, yes. And uh, Hillary Clinton at the time, the first lady of the United States, made a great impression on us. We were young, we wanted to get to change the world, right? And she said one word that really put me into this path. You want to change, you want to make change for women, step in, go into politics, and I went into politics. So when I came back from Beijing right away, the first prime minister then of Cambodia invited me, asked me to be his advisor on women's affair issues. And I, that's when I started. I said, yes, I'm going to get this power and I'm going to make a, a, a difference for the women of Cambodia. I, I would like to share briefly uh, some of, I would not say accomplishments, but I think setting the path for Cambodian women to in, be integrated in society. Uh, I realized very uh, quickly after the first week as Minister for Women's Affairs that the first thing and we need to change was to change this proverb in Cambodia that says, men are gold, women are just a white piece of cloth. Oh, <laughs> yes. And here I was, a member of the first female, the first woman to run the women ministry. Before that, it was ran by the man. They couldn't find a, the right woman. And there, I went in and I said, for sure, we got first to adjust, but not change, but adjust the culture, adjust the society by adjusting, rearranging this proverb. And we changed it to, men are gold, women are precious gems. So the gold and the gem is the setting and the ring. The gold and, and the pearl, yeah, together has this value, this combined value. And the first thing I learned was that can, you cannot exclude the men. But no matter how you want to, you, but um, still, when I see men in certain, uh, situation being good as when we talk about domestic violence, we talk about sexual assault, and we say, why are you here? You shouldn't be here because that inhi inhibits us from discussing uh, the, the real feeling. This is when it does not work. When you have want to change, both men and women have to be in the same room. And I, as minister, I also pass through uh, uh, um, work on the adoption of the prevention of domestic violence. Again, that that um, inclusion of men in the path of, for women to change, to be part of society, make the, the uh, adoption of the domestic violence law in Cambodia successful by not excluding the men. Another uh, point I would like to make um, quickly is now I am one of probably the only a woman in Cambodia as ha having the top leadership in the political party. I'm the vo one of the vice president of the only opposition party in Cambodia that is, not, is, that is now dissolved. You don't want to go there. Why, why we got dissolved, but I'm fighting to get it back. And thank you to, to all of you. Um, why do we have to uh, fight so hard? I fight so hard because of the belief. I, we fight, we must fight.
because we believe in the freedom, we believe, believe in the liberty. And for women, those two values are so, so important. Because as I believe more and more, in, and adopt more and more these values, the liberal values, democratic values, I gain more confidence. I reassured myself that yes, I belong in politics. Because in our society, politics is a dirty word, politics is the world of men. And if we are in politics, we have to first of all say we belong. We belong in this party, and it's up to us to make that party work for women. And I will just say more about how I have made strong changes within the party. And Manon, yeah. you, you are a lobbyist. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting us, and thank you and congratulations for the for the handbook and, and I think the index, which can be super useful for political parties, but also just organizations in themselves. Um, and we'll just to go back a bit, but like, why do we want women to be involved in politics as much as men? For me, it's very simple. It's an issue of democracy uh, because we represent more or less fifty percent of the population, so we need those fifty percent to have also their word on what they want the society to achieve for them and we need, as you were saying, women and men to collaborate together on this. And so I, I have more of an overview, I would say, of the best practices from the, from the different political bodies we interact with and from the organizations we, we, we see doing our work. And I know that everyone agrees, but I think the first step is important, uh, <laughs> uh, binding quotas with a zipper system just to make sure that, you know, it's women, men, women, men, and not just all the women at the, at the bottom. Uh, but it's the first step, and it's not enough, of course. And it needs to go hand in hand with other measures that are going to tackle the structural obstacles that exist, and it needs to be systemic. So it can be trainings, mentoring. We've seen that to be very, very useful and very um, efficient, actually. And even our members in the national context do also some training, uh, for example, on online violence, and that's some the work we've done a lot, and uh, I can come back to that a bit later. Uh, but they've done trainings for women in politics about this issue and how you know, they can advocate that you have laws passed on it. So trainings and mentoring uh, from the political parties is really, really important. Inclusive communications, it seems really uh, you know, ordinary to say that, but seeing yourselves represented is quite good. You, know, you see in the handbook, even the pictures are very diverse, but it's in the way you talk to people, in the way you really involve women, and when I say women, it's all women in all the diversity. Uh, so you're making sure that there's this intersectionality that exists there. And it's of course just a very uh, internal and in-depth process into the political bodies of having this acknowledgement of the issue and just being aware that there's an issue and accepting that there is one and then trying to find the solution. So I think that's really the basis there. And not, you know, I, I, I saw that in the, in the handbook, but not playing the ostrich and you know, just not wanting to look at the issue, but actually being really mindful that it's there and having the political will and commitment to really act and change the things. Um, so yeah, that's more or less the, the best practices I've seen, but really I insist on, on mentoring is really, really important. So, and so forth. So. I, I think we will come back to the question of, of, of mentoring because yeah. there's so much on the agenda also for many political parties and organizations. So that's interesting to hear. And Antoinette. Antoinette. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, as a representative of LIMEC, which is the European Liberal Youth, um, we have a pretty good trend right now of how women and men are being represented at the organization. In fact, our last three presidents are all women. Men are starting to joke that it's becoming more difficult for men to get a leadership position in the young, uh, among the young liberals. Uh, also, within our bureau, um, yeah, three out of our five bureau members are also uh, women. Um, I'm the policy officer of the organization, uh, and we have all the, all, you know, all the structures in place, all the um, guidelines uh, we we adopted in our uh, last congress in London, an um, equality and diversity plan, uh, just to make the emphasis that it's uh, also not just uh, a man-woman uh, disbalance that we're facing, because one thing we're noticing, um, we are not as diverse as we would like to be. Uh, if you walk down the street in, in any given society, 
uh, we don't have as many women of color, for example, women of uh, different ethnical, uh, ethnic uh, origin. Uh, but we're working hard to change this. And what I would think of best practices is, I would go back to what you said about mentoring, but also peer support and peer shaming. Because um, I've been noticing that um, one thing from my personal experience uh, in terms of, of uh, why peer support is so absolutely important is because when I became a bureau member of RIMEC, I was active in the organization for so much time and I was speaking on, on conferences and that was not a problem. But once you become a member of the, organ, of the bureau of the organization, you actually have to represent it. And the first couple of times when someone approached uh, us, uh, giving us an opportunity to speak and represent our, our, the voice of, of young people, and uh, our president, Spania, would come to me and be like, I think that you will be, you will be the best voice for this. I think you know best on that topic. I would start looking into, okay, but I don't have the last data. You know, uh, as in, I would be working on migration and asylum, but I'll be like, I'm not so sure. I didn't li read the last, you know, the, the last month's uh, data. I don't have the perfect numbers. And then if she would ask any, any uh, men at our bureau, they'll be like, Okay, let me see. Yeah, I'm free. I'm free. Okay, we we can do this. Uh, no problem. So, there is a there is a, a, a moment of sense censorship. Uh, there is an element of, of this we do to a great degree to ourselves. Um, we always think that we have to be so perfect and so prepared so that we don't put any shame or any uh, uh, any kind of. Um, misrepresentation to all the other women that are out there and want to have a voice, but to a great degree we do this, but that's also because society treats the mistakes of men and of women in a different way. When I stand up and I'm not prepared for this panel and I say something stupid, people will be like, yeah, but I mean, you know, she's, you know, she's, uh, she's young and she's a woman, so, uh, no, you know. But then, if a man makes a mistake, they're like, yeah, probably he had a difficult day. <laughs> so, that's the... Not to, not to talk about the very usual thing, you know, a man, ma you make a proposal, and then the, the speech round goes on, and the man afterwards makes the same proposal, and it's always taken up in the next yes. man's night. No, that is even in Liberal International Bureau. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So from that, some <laughs> from that perspective, for me personally, one of the best things that uh, have been happening is having other strong women who would be annoyingly insistent that you would use your voice, that uh, who would uh, over and over and over again come to you and tell you, you actually have something to say about this and you have to say it. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, applause to all the panelists and men. And uh, may I remind you, I think, I, as well as Helen Clinton, but Madeleine Albright is also one of our hearers. And is it the, he, he, should, he who is she who said that there is a place in hell for those women who don't support each other. <laughs> uh, but I, I think we have got a very pleased that we have had interesting questions also for, for which relate to what you have said. And more, the, the, the first, what difficulties did you face during your time as being the only woman in such a position? And how did you handle these challenges? I think the audience really looks forward to hearing you on that. Long career, many, many challenges in my political career. I started by saying that I, I am a liberal woman. I didn't understand what it meant then. I understand what it means now because of the challenges that I have had to face in the past, for 25 years now. Changing that proverb, men are gold, women are precious gem, was a successful, was very strategically well, um, well done and I used it all the way. So the campaign to, to, to put Domestic violence law uh, on, uh, to be adopted by the parliament was successful. My 
success in uh, combating human trafficking was very successful. And I also put in, as I was, when I was minister in 2002, was the first time that Cambodia conducted a local election of councillors, permanent councillors. As minister, I had the power, the opportunity, and the duty, to, the responsibility to no longer say, where are the women? but to say, here are the women. And we found 20,000 women from all political parties. Let's bring the women. And the women ministry with the women, with all the NGOs, mentored, adopted uh, all the women. Yeah? So we, a 10% won. Those are easy. This is an easy campaign. This was easy. It, it, my life, my political life became more and more difficult when I stood stronger and stronger on the uh, subject of equality, a leap of liberty, to the point where I went to all the way to um, join the opposition party. I no longer wanted to be in the government in a system that is so corrupt, I might join the, part, the opposition party. Before then, I was already starting to be too much, uh, too strong of a voice. Too strong of a voice. Maybe then if you look back, maybe I should have given the society more time. But then I'm not gonna say sorry. No, you should not say sorry for what you believe in and for the fight. My career, political career, became challenging when I took the Prime Minister to court in 2009. The first person to ever take this dictator to court. I took him to court for insulting me because I stood strong during the election, election campaign. I said, this is against the law. And I, anyway, you, you, for the short, he called me by a name that is not supposed to be used for women. I said, okay, I challenge you. I sue you. And he sued me back. <laughs> Took away my, and, and threatened my lawyer. No lawyer would take Musafu's case. And I said, the hell with it. I'll represent myself. I have nothing to do. I knew nothing about defending yourself in court, but never, never mind. Let's go face the court. Take the Cambodian justice system to court as a woman. And the judge in front of me at that time was a woman. And I lost the case. I can tell you. Right. So the hell with women who don't support women, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went from the law court to the uh, appeal court to the Supreme Court that lasted almost one year. But every single time, man, every single time, you have to take the women with you. I took the women with me, and the men marched with, with me. We all marched to the street and say, yes, it's not about who's a poor. It's about defending the belief, the spirit, the belief of equality. What has she done wrong to deserve to be called by the prime minister? Then my life became even more difficult and to make it sure I am now in exile, have been in exile for the past two years because our party uh, is so successful, so successful because we believe in fighting, fighting for equality. But women within our party have not had a chance yet. We have a long way to go. And I have a Tamika who will speak later who's with the women's movement of Quanta. Yeah. And I, I think we have many questions, but one related also so to what you said, you know, mentoring uh, women on online violence, online harassment. I think this is as much uh, to the first speech we heard. What are the things, because I must admit that there's not that much uh, in, in the handbook of that, and I think it's very worthwhile how to help each other, because mentoring is also very, very, very central. I want to put the question on mentoring then to you. Yeah, about online violence, uh, we 
we've done a lot of work on this, and so we, we had a report already, which is called the Fairness for Rights, um, which was out in 2017. And the objective was first to um, basically define what is online violence against men and girls, because we didn't really have a, a legal definition or precise definition of what it was. And it was to identify what it is and who perpetrates it, what's the objective of it, and then give a few maybe tips on you know what can be done. And then this report got transformed uh, by a team of mine and, and just the, the lobbying itself in a training. And then we delivered this training first to women in politics, because we realized that this online violence is particularly targeting women in politics because the objective is to silence them. Because if you can't use social media now when you do a campaign, you don't really exist anymore. And so that's a way of silencing women and making sure that they don't exist in this uh, public sphere, which our social media is so important nowadays, and to make sure that they can't really have a career into politics. But you know, you, you often, we have some tips on you know, how you can protect yourself, protect your social media and all of this, but it's very short term and we, we don't believe in putting the responsibility on the individual because that's not what should happen. It's only a short term measure. But the, the, the objective of this training was and still is, is because we're training women that are themselves involved in politics, it was to tell them then to try to all together advocate for changes in laws for making sure that this issue is first recognized, that there's an acknowledgement at the international level of the of, of this violence, and just because you often hear that you know online violence is about real violence, it's different from the physical violence. When it's not the case, online violence is part of this continuum of violence against men and girls. It is a gendered violence, and it has uh, real consequences, whether it be on your mental health, on your physical health. Um, so yeah, the the. This is more about how you can then advocate towards you know, the European Parliament, the European Commission, on making sure that this issue is recognized, is taken into account when the European Parliament, the European institutions in general, um, do some legislation on violence, just making sure that it's included there. And I'm talking about the European level, but of course it's valid at the national level, of course, also, which is more what our members uh, do. So yeah, basically it's really, we try to really make sure that it's something that is at the societal level and not just back on the individual, which uh, I would say is really very, very important. And I can make sure maybe to share if, if you want the, the report with all of you if you're interested. Yeah, okay. yeah. we have some ways of doing it. And then if you take the, the question about what role should political parties play and maybe some examples you have, because we have lots of activities going on regarding you know, mentoring, uh, women's academy, training and things. What are, what are the best things that political parties could do? Well, definitely having more mentoring programs and more programs where um, women can get together mm -hmm. and uh, again we go back to the, to the peer support. Even just to talk to people um, that are having the same struggles is already is already a step uh, that is helping. That's why I think um, the program that, for example, um, the liberals do, the Women's Academy um, for Women in Politics, is, is a very, very useful tool. Um, we are not, per se, a political party in LIMEC, although I do know how, for example, my uh, political party functions, but, um, Setting examples uh, also, I think, is a, is a useful tool. As in having strong women that could uh, that that you could aspire to, that you could look up to. That is also a, a form of uh, even if it's not direct mentoring, one on one. Just having a, a a person on a very high leadership position in the party um, gives you the example that 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 you want to follow. Uh, that the voice you wanna you wanna become, um, and I believe for parties having a self analytical um, self analytical opportunities is is the best way forward, because it's it's not just having a quota. And uh, for us in Lineik, we've never been a huge proponent of quotas in any form or shape. 
because you can have a quota of putting so and so amount of women on the list, <coughs> but that doesn't mean that they will become any way close to a leadership position. When you have a, a quota for having women on the list, they normally end up in the last part of it. Um, and of course, you can put more rules to the quota, uh, but it just, you know, it has to, to, to in my opinion, to has, it has to start from, from down up. It has to start with uh, peer support, with mentoring, with going back to um, the party, doing that self-analysis. And since I saw there was a question about the peer shame, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's something we do with our member organizations in LIME. Like when we see uh, certain delegations keep on coming with just a delegation of three men, we normally approach and be like, when you look around this room and you look at the other delegations, what difference do you see with yours? <laughs> um, you know, there is a certain lack of diversity. So, 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 and it's, at some point it starts working. And I have the feeling it works with political parties too. Uh, nowadays, even um, more conservative parties, when they're organizing an event, they're thinking, oh, but there is no woman in the panel. Um, which, which means that peer shaming is working. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And just to, to add to your answer, I think there's a few things that political bodies can do that are very practical. But it's, uh, you know, once they have the 50% women and the 50% men, is to, to make sure that those women are actually in winnable districts, so there's a way for them to actually win the elections, and then they have enough funding to do it. Because, you know, in the end, as we say in French, um, it's the uh, l'air de la guerre, I don't know how you say that in English. L'air de la guerre. It's the most important thing in the end. You need the money to be able to run a campaign, so it's to make sure that there's also equality there. And also, in the end, that the political parties programs reflect this ambition, that in the program there's policies that are really thought about where we think about the impact it's going to have on women, the women's experiences in life. So it needs to be um, comprehensive. Of course, quotas are not enough. It's, again, a first step, but you need to have a more comprehensive um, thing happening inside the party. And I like what you were saying about being self-analytical, just really doing this analysis, and that's why the index is super important, to realize first if you're inclusive or not, which with me, you're not that much. So then you, you have the cold, true fact that this is what you need to improve. Uh, when there was mentioned also, some of you, you know that there are other factors than gender when we're talking about inclusivity. And, but we, when we developed the, the index, we were very much aware that facts about gender, they are available. But then, you know, the, your race, it is ethnicity, that is not to be, to be registered. And therefore, we cannot have an index working with that. But, but you know, mutatis mutandis, as, as the, 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 the Latin, you can use the handbook, you know, to, to check whether you are inclusive in other ways. And this is something we, we really wish, wish to, be, to be done. I can then not refrain, even though I think the organizers would hate me, but I cannot refrain to say something about electoral system and quotas. When I was here in the European Parliament, my Belgian liberal colleague uh, in, the, in the relevant committee, she met, had the, a report commission comparing what kind of electoral systems were the best for women's representation. And my dear friends, it was proportional representation and including open lists, I, that is something, you know, you, you don't, in such a system, you cannot have quotas because it, the, the, you know, the voter is voting for a person. So what you need to have is exactly, you know, the, the equality of resources. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the Nova Stranka in Bosnia is a fantastic leadership. They had a fa fantastic job to ensure that women and men with equal resources, equal campaign resources and money, during uh, elections, so they get the resources. Then, but that's about, you know, so quotas uh, in legislative bodies are not as important as for executive. I would not stand here, hadn't there been an informal quota in our league. There was an informal quota, not written, 
but we were three in the presidium, and one had to be a girl. This was one of the first steps that pushed me a little bit before. Then, you know, I got my convincing habits, because there was also a, a, a quota that in executive bodies, in the municipalities, uh, and at boards at national level, there had to be a certain amount, of, about 40, 50%, so to say. So that gave also more competence. And in fact, in the Nordic countries, it worked in that way that women, men had to be dealing with social issues, with educational issues, and women dealt with more technical issues. So I think there is something that is reciprocal there, because that is also, I think, important. And now I put the question to any man here uh, who is here, because to answer the question, how can there was a, how can uh, men help women? So Phil, it's for you to ask. <laughs> to ask what, 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 what have you, have you, have you done? Well, I think mentoring is really important and uh, we men should not be um, shy in mentoring women and uh, I've certainly done that over a period of about 15 years. I think it's extremely important, the um, mentoring, and also when we get into positions of uh, where we're the chair of the committee, um, we actually must to make sure that when we stand down, uh, at least there's going to be some competitive women who are in a, in a good place to take over. I think this is another thing. We need to actually make sure that when we're, at, when we're in the positions of power, we actually do, we actually give opportunities to the to, to the women around us, and I think that's also a very very important thing. Um, I think also when we're in power, we need to actually make sure that the programmes are there. I think that if you actually look at our group, uh, our um, our delegation of sixteen that were in the European Parliament until last week, we had uh, nine women and seven men. Um, and uh, before the election, the, the, before the selection process, um, the party put in an attempt to actually uh, have a quotarise it to, to help women. It was actually ruled illegal because we had never had in, in the proportional system of the European Parliament any problem in terms of proportions of women. We, in the 2009 Parliament, it was 50-50, 2014, we only managed to elect one. 11 of us lost our seats, and the one that was elected was a woman. And so, on the UK law, um, the women in our party in the European Parliament were not an underrepresented group. So it was basically told that we couldn't do it. But lo and behold, it didn't matter because um, when in an open system, uh, the women still did better than the men at getting the top positions on the lists. But why was that? It was because we had our leadership scheme. Now, if you look at the men, the seven men who were elected, we were all, not so much all old-timers, but we'd all, all been either MEPs before, MPs before, or in the case of Anthony Hook and Dean Esch, uh, they had been um, high, high positions in the party. Anthony, Anthony was the number two to Catherine the time before, so he, he was, he's been around a long time. If you look at the women, other than Catherine, that were elected, the other eight, seven of them came through the, le the women's leadership scheme and were absolutely new to elected politics. None of the men were new. Uh, this has resulted in a, a view that maybe we should start a men's leadership scheme <laughs> because we're not because the, the people coming through now are the women because we've got the women's leadership scheme. And we've had the similar situation in, the, in, in, in Westminster, where we, uh, um, we've only got 11 now, but it's seven women and four men. Um, now, again, that was, that was a, a rather doctoring the system that got us that. Uh, but doctoring the system also has negative impacts. So I, I go for the training ahead of doctoring the system, because uh, by insisting that women were the candidates in certain places, where it was winnable, um, we actually found out it discriminated against our, um, our good Muslim candidates because we are behind in getting 
women into, a, into that position with Muslims. But we're also a long way behind with the men. But it meant that in a couple of three places where we should have had Muslim men, we had white women. Uh, and you have to actually look out for the unintended consequences. So what we've found is that this leadership scheme has been wonderfully successful, massively successful, but our attempts at doctoring the system haven't. So I just wondered if that's a, a lesson we can learn. But, but basically it's up to us men to actually bring on as many women as we can. Uh, and it's probably easier for some of us than for others. We, we, have, we have also uh, a, a slide which shows similar questions, you know, uh, like say, uh, cult sometimes cultural questions, but, but this, uh, what, and what can you do about it? Because there are also remedies, that is, that is the point. What are the remedies? I mean, you have, uh, once have changed the society, but if that is the case, can you do it while you are, you are going for more equal uh, responsibilities in the family? Uh, well, it has huge implications, of course. Uh, it's one of the main you know, structural obstacles that women face. And we talked about care responsibilities, it's of course the children, but it's the parents, you know, it's the, someone in the family. And we, we've done actually a lot of work on this at the, at the European Women's Lobby, and we've realized that a lot of this care work is unpaid and not recognized at all. It's often seen as a burden, and it's always put down on women. Uh, and it, of course, hinders them from then having politician care, uh, career into politics uh, because someone has to do it. And so if not the men, then it's up to them. And it's quite hard to do this and then to also have a work job and also to have a career into politics. Um, and there's, of course, things that can be done there and, I mean, changing society, basically. Um, but um, to go a bit more in detail about this, um, it's making sure first that this work is recognized uh, that this work is seen as valuable so that everyone wants to do it and so that in the end it's something that is shared and it's making sure you know that we have for example um, a parental leave so that fathers can also take the time off and it's the case in some EU countries it's not you know equal everywhere but it's to make sure that those men also have the opportunity to take care of their children is to make sure that there's carers leave and it's been introduced a bit to the work life balance earth uh, like balance directive, yes, uh, which set a standard, which is again not enough, but it's a basis uh, for all EU countries to make sure it, it exists first. Um, but it really come to go through this recognition of this work and making sure that uh, in the end it's uh, yeah, seen as valuable and it's paid, and so that women have the opportunity to, to share this work and if they want to keep on doing it, they can, but it's compensated in a way. Um, so that's one of the main structural obstacles that exist. It is a systemic thing, so it needs a systemic change. Uh, it needs a cultural change, of course, also, just to understand more and to, to not see this work as being only done by women and only putting down on them. I would, I would add also from, from uh, our experience uh, that while you are changing the, the, the rules and the, and the system, it's important that you organize meetings at yeah. times. How the times you are organizing things, and also, I mean, we have many political parties in 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 Omaha and Alda. They have, you know, let's say somebody taking care of the children during the, the conferences and things like that. So there are these practical things you can also do to enable for for the, the person that has at least children's responsibilities. It's a little bit more difficult if you are responsible for your own mother. But or, or father, but ma mother in many, many many cases. So so that's but that, that that I think I mean how we are working and we are not just making it possible for those men or women mm -hmm. who do not have care responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
No, it, thank you for mentioning it because it's very <coughs> practical things and yeah. things that even us as an NGO face. When we have meeting board meetings, for example, and we have uh, women that are part of the membership that have children, we don't have the facilities for this and it's also from our resources, but that's something that we actually are talking about right now. I'm, I'm getting some signals that, that time is running out. And I also want to respect the, the most important thing at, at, a, at a meeting like this, you know, the talk uh, afterwards. L'esprit d'escalier, je ne sais pas si il existe une expression comme ça, but the, you know, the, the, the idea, good idea is you would like to bring to, to Thomas or to Viola, uh, to Jana and, uh, and to, to Chloe. I mean, this, these things you also would need to say. But let's say uh, a, a final uh, round from, from our, uh, our dear uh, panelists, if you want to take up anything of any of these questions that have not been asked. Uh, Answered yet, for instance, is there a glass ceiling? That's a question. Yeah, please, more. Of course, there is a glass ceiling. Come on, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. It's so obvious. I want to put the emphasis on the difficulties, the challenges, the danger of women in politics in the countries like Cambodia, and especially if you come from the opposition party. It's so, no matter how equal, how, it, there is always that, how do you move, uh, travel 20 kilometers as a woman on a motorcycle, sometimes a bicycle. She wants to serve, she wants to serve, be part of the party, but she has to travel 20 kilometers on the bicycle. Her husband ha does not, will lend the bicycle but his husband cannot take her along all the time. So these are barriers, these are challenges, these are, uh, there are risks that women in politics, in opposition, in countries where there is no rule of law, where it's so repressive, and you have to acknowledge the courage, the uh, commitment of our women at the rural level, at the, we have women uh, branches, um, movement everywhere, but they, we finally had to say to um, our party that special, the women's movement, the women in the rural areas deserve not just recognition, deserve every resource that the, the party has, uh, put it there so that uh, we at least uh, help our women to be out of danger, to have, um, to have the mind, the, the spirit, and to be free to um, to fulfill her 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 wish to be in politics at the rural level and as opposition member. And we can easily know the women of Afghanistan how many they yeah. use their their Manon. Uh, okay. Last good <laughs> idea. Last word. Um, I think in the end it's up to you have to walk the talk. Uh, it's great that we have this discussions, it's great that we bring up these ideas, but now we need to make sure that they exist and that they implement it. And I think for this, there's a need for the people that have the power in political parties, for example, so men, but also white women, to recognize the power dynamics that exist, to be mindful of it, and to work against it, uh, to make sure that then there can be this diversity inside the political party that exists. Um, so it, it goes through very simple things like listening to other people, looking for the other people, going out of your political party, trying to, you know, re, uh, ask yourself why are those people not in the political party? What? Why is it? Why? Is it because of the way we're structured? Is it of the, because of the way of um, we communicate? You know, uh, the access. It can be really simple things, but like if women with disabilities can't access the the space while being in the meeting. Of course, they're not going to be there. So it's really reflecting on all of this and then taking the concrete action to make sure that then those obstacles don't exist anymore. And that's the first step. And then at the same time, and I really say it at the same time that you have these more short term solutions like the quota being stuck, we need to work towards <coughs> a structural change. And it's to through your policies, through your program, through how you work as a European party and national parties. Um, so yeah, it's really hand in hand. 
those areas that he thought the most, uh, you know, golden and go diamonds. It's the word golden diamonds. The gold, the gold <laughs> and, and the gems. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we have a, a, a slogan for that. That's yeah, a, actually yeah. a, a quite good one. Um, but I w as I was listening to you, I remembered uh, again in one of the first panels that I participated, one of the older, uh, the previous um, LIMEC uh, presidents, one of the first ones that were uh, female LIMEC presidents, when I shared that I'm very nervous of, of how I'm going to represent the organization, she just sent, sent me a text message that quoted, um, Carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre man. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, the real test at the youth liberal organization, we're trying to do our utmost to give women the confidence to at least have the confidence of a, of a mediocre man. Because for me, the real test would be if in 20 years, uh, we'll be able to be not so harsh towards ourselves and to be able to say, okay, I can make a mistake and that is not going to tarnish how women in general do because it's not so rare that women participate in high-level forums. Okay. some of us tomorrow when we are going to continue the discussion on Cambodia and, and, uh, and your situation. So you are both, I think everybody is most welcome also for that. Do you want to know why I am in exile? Then come tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs>